have a different set of rules. Uh, and part of that is about experience. Part of that is about the wing loading, right? So if you're, if you're right. carrying a greater wing loading, you can accommodate a higher wind velocity. I can't. I'm, a, I'm like a 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 wing load right now. Like 0. 0.6? As, as we say, my condolences, <laughs> but this, <laughs> this is how you learn. We all had to deal with driving the great big jalopy. You know what I mean? Yep. It's, it's, and if you screw up royally on your landing, you have a greater chance of walking away. So I exactly. understand. You know, in, yeah, you know, and that's why I'm on it until, until I get some of these things you're talking about down. Yeah. I don't really care to go to anything smaller. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, I think that one of the, helpful things is to start off with figuring out what your ground speed is on that parachute. Um, and so you can do that in a variety of ways. There, there's technical ways, you know, where you actually take up a GPS, for instance. Uh, a lot of hikers have just a simple wrist knot GPS that just tells you your ground speed. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a simple matter of, of either jumping in an, on a no wind day, right? And then you just look at the numbers. Um, or jumping on a day that's sort of normal where there is some wind up there where you're doing your checks at say 3,000 feet. You fly this way for a while and you go, all right, I'm going 12 miles per hour. Huh, that's pretty slow. And then you turn 90 degrees to one side or the other, pick one. And then you go, oh, now I'm going 22 miles an hour. And then you turn 90 degrees again in the same direction, which is obviously now you know going to be towards a run. You go, Oh, now I'm going 37 miles an hour. Oh, okay. So you take those three numbers, right? The three data points. And you might have to repeat it in your head a couple of times. And then when you get back to the ground, you add up those three speeds and you divide by three. Okay, that's simple. It is. And then it's going to give you uh, roughly the ground speed of your parachute. And then you'll know, okay, well, if the wind is greater than that, I'm going backwards. If the wind is equal to that, I'm going straight down. So it'll give you an idea of, of the range of your parachute. Uh, all that said, as long as you can more or less hold position and at least come straight down on your landing, safe skydiving can happen. It's just a different kind of canopy flight. Yeah, I've seen people, like, I didn't, I wasn't jumping because I was in the program. The winds were too crazy, but I've seen the like elevator ride where literally they were going down. Yeah. And yeah. then there was another one where <clears throat> they were going backwards. Yeah. So if the winds were to shift enough where you're going to be blown backwards, what's the best method to even deal with that? Yeah. Well, if, if I'm in that situation, the first thing I'm going to try to do is maintain airspeed because I want to be uh, dealing with a, a, a canopy that's pressurized, right? So when I slow down, obviously I'm going to go backwards faster, right? But also by slowing down, I reduce the pressurization of my airfoil which makes it squishier and bounces around more and might even take a collapse. It also reduces the drag of the system. The faster I go, the more drag I have. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm in brakes, I reduce the drag vector on the canopy quite a bit, right? It's bigger, so there's a greater effect. And now I've slowed down enough that if I hit some weird turbulence, the canopy can surge forward because it was the drag from high speed that was preventing it from surging. And if you're going really fast, the canopy is not gonna be able to surge. Um, and if it does, it's a very slow surge. So, so you can run this experiment to sort of prove the point. You hold some brakes and then you let them off really quickly. Then you hold less brakes and you fly for a little while and then you let them off really quickly. You'll notice that from deep breaks, you have a greater surge. The canopy moves a, a greater, you know, if you can measure it in degrees, you know, it might surge, you know, 50 or 60 degrees on the pitch axis, and you're going to be very light in the loafers. You know, you got no lift and therefore no weight. The canopy sort of relaxes and is very vulnerable to the, the sky kind of, you know, bullying it around and twisting and changing it into, into a form that you don't want. Um, and so the, the forward surge is prevented by the airspeed. You'll see that, that in, let's say, less brakes, and if you lift your hands up, uh, it doesn't want to surge. And if you, let's say, do a turn, you gain some extra airspeed, and then you let off, and then you hit those brakes and release them, it won't surge at all. The canopy will go behind you, and it'll stay behind you for a little while, and then slowly return to center. It's, I mean, it's the same nylon, it's the same wing loading, at least in theory, but 
you've actually changed the characteristics of your parachute by flying fast. So therefore, where I'm going with this is, if I know I'm facing into the wind, trying to hold my position, navigating back towards the drop zone, looking over my shoulders, right? <laughs> so like Jason does, you know, he's done a lot of rounds. I've done a lot of round jumps. You look over your shoulder a lot when you're on a parachute that only goes eight miles an hour ground speed. You're, you're flying backwards. So what? It doesn't bother you, you just kind of get used to it. So that part is fine. But if you keep your hands up mostly, that'll help keep the canopy alive with airspeed. Now let's go to the next level of this. If I keep my hands all the way up where my brake lines are trailing behind the canopy loose, now there is gonna be a delay in the effect of any downward motion on my toggles, right? So I have to like take up the slack until it does something. Maybe it does something here, but above that it's just slack. It does nothing. I'm not even holding the steering wheel really. So um, therefore my ability to actively control the pitch of my parachute is, is lost a little. All right, so if I hit a, hit a thermal turbulence, uh, you know, it could be wake turbulence or, or mechanical turbulence off of buildings or trees um, or the flat irons or <laughs> whatever. whatever. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, you're in Colorado, right? So the canopy wants to dive and surge. So are you gonna just hang under the parachute and you know, pray to Allah, or are you gonna stop that surge and actively take your fate into your own hands, right? You're gonna yeah. sharply stop that parachute from getting in front of you and get it you know, above your head again where you can produce lift to make the lines tension. I mean, you know, if the lines are tight, the parachute's gonna remain in, in good form. So therefore, in turbulence, I like to fly with my hands down enough that I've tensioned my brakes, but I haven't significantly dimpled the tail. I didn't pull the tail down, but my brakes are activated so that I can stop a surge. Now, if I'm flying in such winds that I, any application of the brakes is going to make me go backwards, but I still might need to make my corrections into the wind, right? Because even being 10 degrees off the wind line when it's that extreme is going to be a backwards and sideways motion. I got to keep it pinned on that heading of, of the wind line, which might be changing, <laughs> right? <laughs> So number one, we try to use our hips to steer the parachute. You try to, if your leg straps are forward on your, uh, on your femurs a little bit, you'll have more authority to twist the harness system to make those little changes. Um, it especially works better if you got your chest strap loose, right? Because you can offset more on the main lift web and you don't distort the parachute really at all. It's a great way to steer down low especially if you're on a smaller, faster canopy, you know, like under 200 square feet, you lean into it, it'll turn pretty nice. But if you're on, you know, 0 0.6 pounds per square foot, you may find that leaning in the harness, you got, you got to really be extreme and it takes a long time and it feels kind of slow and, and, and anno annoyingly unresponsive. Um, and so what I would suggest then is in addition to leaning in the harness to make those little corrections, you lay your hands on the rear risers and you do harness rear riser turns. Okay. Isn't going to cut down on your airspeed as much as harness toggle turns. And it also won't increase the angle of attack and yaw as much, right? So there's on toggle and off toggle. And, and it does a lot of things that you don't want it to do. Whereas harness turn, it just, and it turns. There's no swinging around afterwards. There's, there's no hangover, as I call it. The consequences of what you did don't linger and result in oscillations that were, are, gonna, are gonna create other problems. You know, future collapses or future uh, ineffective flare, right? If you do that little correction at 50 feet, if you do that correction on the harness or harness and gentle rear riser, you can go straight from that maneuver into the flare because it's not swinging around. It's a pure, clean maneuver. And if you go harness toggle turn, or worse yet, just toggle turn without any harness, the, the parachute will do things that will take several seconds to recover from, All right, unless you're really, really on it and you know how to counter things. But that takes years to, to be able to mm -hmm. feel that out. So in the meantime, do turns down low, you know, that are, that are, you know, they're going to be necessary, but do the kind of turns that don't induce oscillations like that.
Okay, that makes sense. And don't reduce your airspeed. And, and so I'm gonna add one other layer to this. Um, and this is kind of newer Intel. Um, <clears throat> we find that if you, if you grab the rear risers all the way at the top, think about what your brake lines are doing. Right? If you're grabbing just, be no, just below your connector links, your brake lines are loose. So if you're steering with harness rear risers and then suddenly the canopy surges towards the ground and you know, the ground's coming up real quick at you, now it delays the effect of you spiking your toggles down to stop the descent. Whereas if you grab the rear risers low enough that you're just beginning to tension the tail, right? You're actually, you know, your brake lines are activated as you're doing those harness rear riser turns, then as soon as you come off of that rear riser, you're in instantly activating the tail and you can stop your descent rate right now. Worth exploring, so worth exploring. So, yeah. so what do you do when you get that kind of information? You pull high and you try these different maneuvers. Don't take my word for it. I want you to feel it. You know, I want you to actually do these, these maneuvers that will save your life. It has been said many times, there's those who have and those who will land off the drop zone. The ability to, to choose a good field, to the ability to fly a nice pattern into that field and set yourself down safely and softly, maybe not standing up, but safe where you can walk away afterwards. That's a complicated story. And it's a story that hasn't been told very efficiently and very effectively, and we need to tell it. So I've been working on uh, this body of information, well, it turns out my whole life, didn't realize it, uh, but, but putting together the, the information that's gonna help you evaluate what's beneath you when you didn't plan on being there over that baseball field, over that backyard, over that farm field, over that unknown DZ. Beware of changing that plan too low. So by about 2,000 feet, you really should have it. You've not just picked out where you're going to land, but how you're going to fly the pattern. And if it's super tight, um, you certainly want to make sure that you're almost kicking the trees on the, the near side of the field so you don't overshoot uh, to the other side. As a skydiver, you're going to be in these situations where you're landing off the drop zone. You don't want to be uh, a Pollyanna ivory tower skydiver that yeah every every time you you jump or you lie land in the drop zone i always land on the target i always land on my feet well what if you don't are you ready for that so that's what this video is about dz unknown let's go to the classroom and talk about some details when i'm facing into the wind my glide is limited i'm flying steeper relative to the earth so that means that I'm fighting the wind, you can think of it that way, and any reduction in airspeed is going to hurt me. Any steepening of glide, I mean, you know, substantially steep, steepening of glide uh, may hurt me as well. It's windy though, so I'm keeping my hands up in full flight. If I try a little bit of rear risers, that may help. A lot of rear risers, I'll lose speed, right? So what I need to think about right now is, is kind of keeping my, uh, my knees up, staying real small, uh, making sure that I don't lose any forward speed. Yeah. We weren't making much progress towards the drop zone. Multiple options. Um, I wasn't making a lot of progress across this road, but in this case, I think I made the good, the good choice. You can get surprised crossing over roads low that, oh, look, there's a power line or something. But Google Maps is cool because what you can do is find that location, right click on your mouse, and then you can measure the distances. So you can get an idea of how far from the drop zone is acceptable. We're gonna talk about spot range. <laughs> 